Hello, and welcome to Roleplay Ramblings, Episode 4 of Season 2. Today we're going to talk about sharing. Sharing is one of those things that in uh, the community of roleplaying can be easily uh, overlooked. And I'm not talking sharing like I bring potato chips to the table and everybody can have potato chips. I'm talking sharing the role-playing experience. Um, and some of that is because, well, players are from all walks of life. We are different people. Uh, we have different backgrounds. We have different personalities. We have different incomes. We have uh, different levels of happiness. Uh, some of us are depressed when we sit down at the table. Some of us aren't. Uh, we might be distracted by an argument we had with the wife or um, our children uh, might uh, be doing things that they're not supposed to be doing and therefore we're distracted. Um, and sharing is one of those things at the table that can easily be abused. And maybe I should say the lack of sharing. It's easy for people who are more dynamic to kind of control the table. And uh, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, because sometimes that's what makes a group, is one character shining, being the spotlight of the story, uh, can really make a big difference in how and impact the story. In, in some ways, those players can even become important enough to basically be uh, tools like an NPC for the GM. So I think there's a few things that do need to be discussed with this issue, and it's a little bit sensitive, I think, in the sense that as a player, and, I, and I'm separating player from character here, they're not going to be used synonymously. A player is a player, and a character is the character. Uh, the character basically is what you represent in-game. player is you acting. Okay? Um, player also has certain rights and responsibilities to the group. When you sit down at the table to play Dungeons & Dragons, Pathfinder, Warhammer, whatever game it is, you know, and it doesn't have to be a role-playing game. This is actually true to the whole tabletop community. Um, Will Wheaton kind of says it best. Don't be a dick. He says it. He says it all the time. And he's right. You're there for a community experience. For some of us, it might be our escape from reality. That sounds bad. But it, it might be our escape. This is how we vent. This is how we relieve our stress. Because we can't communicate with the world about whatever we're going through. Or, or in some cases, we might not even know we're going through something. And I say we as an all-inclusive statement. Um, because, well, we'll come back to me personally. I don't know. Uh, so, I think the first thing is... Somebody always is a little bit more dynamic in a gaming group, and that noise is my cat chasing her tail. So, that's that. Um, and as a dynamic player, I think you need to know when to lead, or know when to listen to your GM telling you not to lead. That's that's important too. Oh no, she's not chasing her tail. She's Tail. She's chasing a Q-tip because she's a wackamadoo. Anyway, she's chasing a Q-tip. Um, so knowing when to lead is one of those things of sensitivity uh, because one player who's not as dynamic as the other player might decide that they get out of there. They might want to lead the group, or they might try and be a leader, um, and you being a more dynamic individual, oh boy, my kitten, thank you kitty, um, they might be more, you might be a more dynamic individual than the other one. And you might not realize that they have a need to step up and express themselves. Uh, I, I would say, I mean, it's good that leaders develop in every campaign. Um, but if your character isn't the one, if you're, yeah, if your player, if you're a player and your character isn't the one that should necessarily be leading the group, I would say that you should kind of 
taper back and control your personality as an individual human being and respect the other characters. Uh, now, sometimes the players don't necessarily see the appropriate leader for the campaign. And maybe the GM kind of needs to nudge people in the right direction there. Um, and that's that's where GMs, this takes a little bit of time on how to motivate characters. Uh, some GMs don't even know how. Uh, I've been in games where I've seen some players pretty much run the campaign in downtime. Uh, because if they didn't use their downtime to do things like investigate parts of the city, they wouldn't have the clues they had to move forward in the game. Um, and the GM let him do that. So that character kind of became a leader behind the scenes, and that character, that player, fell in love with that character. Uh, so, as a leader, I think sometimes you, and when I say a leader, I don't mean the leader of the, the player group, or the character group, I mean the leader of the player group. So as a dynamic person, or the person who has maybe the most dynamics or the most leadership qualities within the group, sometimes you kind of, in my opinion, you're like an assistant GM. Not necessarily for rules, but because your strong personality, you help motivate other people in your group to play a better game. And sometimes that is more challenging than actually being the characters, the leader for the characters of the group. Um, so... Use your dynamics, recognizing that you're a leader type, um, and try not to butt heads with another dynamic, which is something, there's almost always two alpha dogs in a group. Uh, sometimes the two alpha dogs are so stubborn that it just kind of doesn't work out. Uh, and you can often tell this because one alpha dog usually runs off on their own in the group and um, tries to cause all kinds of trouble and get the group to try and bail them out. Uh, the other alpha dog is actually doing things beneficial and helping weed the group. Um, or I should say alpha male, that whole syndrome thing. Uh, so, as a GM, when you recognize there's a leader or somebody trying to step up and be a leader, it's a good idea to help look for and create opportunities for the player to express the character's interest in the storyline. And actually, this, this is a little dangerous, but I'm, I'm going to go out there and say, if you have five characters in your group by five different players, in some fashion, every single one of them should be a leader. And the, really, the only way you can do this is by listening to what the players say and do and how they act. Um, and I, Now, I'm not saying that they should all be butting heads to lead the group every time. Um, in fact, I think the more you mature as a, a role player, the, the more likely you and your players are to sit down and discuss the things that are happening. Uh, but allow them to exercise their ideas freely and you will develop a leader of your group. And that, that is super, super, super important. Um, because otherwise you're going to be stonewalled a little bit more easily, I think, by indecision. So listening to your players, um, and then in that fashion they become a leader. Now, as a player, if you listen to the other players, you can help the GM by dropping, um, not so much clues, but maybe passing notes back and forth of, hey, you know, this can happen or this can happen because of this. Some GMs aren't um, responsive to that. So, you know, talk to your GM about it first. Uh, and then for the GMs, uh, knowing when to share uh, this information is pretty crucial. Uh, so if you want, you've got five players with five characters or five total characters, and you find you've got this great clue that you want to give the cleric, but if you give it to the cleric at the wrong time, like you're in the middle of one of your adventure paths that's kind of featuring one or two of the other 
types of classes that are out there, or the other roles that are out there, it might get forgotten. And then that cleric opportunity for leadership might be lost. And I, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't say that I have a formula that says, okay, I'm going to come back and let this shine on you and let this shine on you and let this shine on you. But I do try and spread out leadership roles to help develop characters more fully. Um, and like, I wouldn't even say it's once every level because I generally try and make sure that there's enough experience for every three to five adventures that players can level up. Um, at least within Pathfinder and Dungeons and Dragons type of games. Uh, Rifts, that's not so much the case. I, I, uh, I mess with that experience system a lot in Fudge It, and I just say, okay, you guys did this, and you did this really well, you can go up level, or whatever. Uh, but, I think learning to share the information at the right time is important. O or, reshare the information. And, uh, that, that's important too. Um, and keep in mind the dynamics of that particular character. So, what's a good example? Um, we have a cleric in one of our groups that does not like doing research. Um, and it's not so much that the character doesn't like doing research. The player feels that his time isn't... Uh, his downtime for researching isn't rewarded enough. So what we did is we made sure that the next time he found research, we didn't wait two or three sessions for the knowledge to come to fruition and play a part in the story. Uh, we made it happen immediately. So we started with the downtime, and we went right into the game, and we put closure on it, and he felt much more rewarded. Uh, now, some of that had to do with the personality of the individual playing the cleric. And again, this is a community. You have to take all of that into account. So uh, one of the craziest things I've ever done is I've had a, I had a group of, I think it was 10 players. The youngest was 8 and the oldest was 42. You have to keep enough action um, and story to keep the 8-year-old involved. So, you know, the dynamics of an eight-year-old playing his character are not that great. But the dynamics of an eight-year-old in combat smashing a goblin skull with a hammer is pretty awesome. So that's where kind of the role changes up a little bit. In combat, you let the, I let the youngins lead combat a little bit more. And I did things a little bit more dynamically to make them feel emotionally boosted and happy about being there to kind of counter the in-between times of I'm so bored. Um, I kind of built up uh, anticipation for combat by letting them do crazy, crazy dynamic things. Uh, one kid played a goblin, and the goblin had a military pick. He, like, took a guy's kneecap off with it, and, and you know, stuff like that. Just let them do nutty stuff. Um, of course, for the eight-year-olds, when they didn't roll so well, I kind of cheated a little bit. You know, because... They had to have the experience, otherwise they'd leave role-playing and never come back, right? Uh, and then, so, when your players kind of get off track with leadership and they kind of start butting heads, uh, as a GM, you kind of kind of have to take the role of, uh, I'm not going to say judge or arbiter, or, um, but you kind of have to step in and kind of have to make something happen. And... I usually do that by uh, projecting the direction I want the story to go with an overlooked clue to another player. <laughs> because then it stops them from fighting, it diffuses the whole situation, or it stops them from butting heads, it diffuses the whole situation, and they have a new direction to go. Uh, Make sure. I kind of got off track a little bit, so I need, I need to refocus here a minute. Anyway, that's pretty much uh, that. Pretty much covers it. So today, knowing when to share is really more about 
the players um, learning how to be dynamic with each other um, and helping build the community and the group. Uh, it, it's a very difficult thing to do. And I, the right word for what I was trying to say with the GM is coach. Um, or diffuse the situation, like I said. So, basically, players sit down to be a part of a community and have a good time. Some of us, well, all of us have different experiences and different backgrounds in the real world. We then attempt to leave the real world behind and play in this fantasy setting. By doing so, sometimes, you know, we need a leader. Somebody's going to try and rise up. Um... And it's important not to step on other people's toes while you do that because that's never good for the group. And by learning some of these things of how to diffuse situations, uh, recognize certain opportunities, and give everyone leadership opportunities, I think it helps diffuse the situations a lot more. Thanks for watching, guys. This has been Roleplay Ramblings 3, 4, I don't remember now, of Season 2. Uh, please check out my Kickstarter. Share this video if you like it. Like it. Leave comments. Um, I want to know what you guys want me to talk about. You're in an important part of my community. I could not be doing this without you guys. Uh, actually, I wouldn't. If, if people didn't ask me for more stuff like this, I would not have done Roleplay Ramblings too. I was gonna. I was gonna bypass this season and wait till next year to do it again. But a lot of people have nudged me, just like. Uh, you can expect a cooking video soon. I've been being nudged a lot about a cooking video. Thanks for watching, guys. Please check out my Kickstarter. I think I already said that, but you know, I got ADHD. Anyway, later. Oh, next week? Or next episode, I should say. I'm going to try and talk about spotlighting. Um, it's probably going to be a shorter episode, and it'll be the final episode for the season outside of the two special episodes with Jason Hardy and Jason Bullman. Uh, from Origins and Gen Con this year. Or, yeah, this year. It's still this year, I think. Anyway, happy holidays.